Hello and welcome to Audiobook Reviews. In this video, I'll be discussing The Light of All That Falls by James Islington, the final book in the Lycanius trilogy. Now, I've done, obviously, I did video reviews for the first two books, a couple of other extra videos, and I still am a huge fan of this trilogy. This was, I thought, really, really good. There were some issues here and there for sure, but overall, the ending I thought was extremely satisfying. And it was something that I was a little worried about as I commented in some of the other videos. Islington managed to do certain things that are really, really hard to do. Uh, writing with time travel, always very difficult no matter the medium. There are a lot of issues usually with that. And he stuck with the time travel with really specific rules. There, there's no like alternate timelines. It is very much set, whether it's the past or future, it's already actually happened. And so that was a big recurring theme is that people don't actually have the ability to change the past or change the future. It's all kind of set in stone. That I think made sure that it would work well, but that also when you couple the time travel with the visions of the future, that for sure will happen in exactly that way it can make it a little bit difficult to write around. And I thought that Islington did a fantastic job. And especially for a newer author, that's something I would think would be extremely challenging to do. So that still worked really, really well with those pieces. And this book starts out with a year time jump. I commented at my uh, book two review, I figured they would do at least a small time jump. And that didn't make sense. We immediately jump forward a year and then kind of checked in to see where our characters were. Now, with that, you did get kind of the sense that some things that had happened and you heard about them, but it was done pretty well, too. Time jumps can be difficult because you don't want to then fall into the trap of, oh, I have to exposit all this information that happened. And it felt pretty natural with how that it worked. We found out what was going on with Davian for that year when he was still imprisoned. We found out what was going on with Asha while she was in tributary, and what were and Caden and all the others were doing. And from there, things did start to escalate pretty quickly. There was still kind of a lot that needed to happen. And this book really more so focused on the big picture. That was something too I liked about the trilogy overall. The first book started off kind of small. None of the characters really knew what was going on. And through the plot device of Caden, slowly getting his memories back, other characters having their visions, other things. You felt like you were really getting a lot of things pieced together. And once again, that's something I feel is very difficult. And I've seen other stories where there were issues because of things being done that way. This was all handled extremely well with the narrative, this, the pieces slowly being uncovered and still managing to have big reveals, even when you kind of know what's going to happen. And something they touched on is with the visions of the future, you know what's going to happen, but you don't know when necessarily in a lot of circumstances. You don't know how, you don't know a lot of the things around it. So it can definitely play out differently. And something that was commented, and I think the second book was there was an auger one time had a vision of the future that he was going to be hung for treason. He freaked out and he bolted. And then because he left without leave, he was hung for treason. So Kind of that interesting look of you might be causing it without even realizing it. And it was something that was frustrating to me at points, though, because you had the characters, specifically the veteran, who 100% believed that everything was set. That was actually the big thing they were fighting against. They were being told by who they thought was L, who we've been told is Shamaloth, actually, who's the kind of the, the dark one, the big bad. He wants to make it so that time is not completely set and that you can make different choices and that you're not all kind of fated to do the same thing. So they 110% believe that fate is completely set. But there are so many times where I'm like, why don't you just kill them or do this like that would solve all your problems? And like, what would really happen if they just like, I'm going to swing a sword, like, what are you going to suddenly slip? Is the universe really going to stop you? So that's a little bit frustrating. But through the narrative, we do see that even if the characters are doing something they think is completely different from what they saw the future being, it still kind of ends up that way. So still big reveals, but that, that was a little bit frustrating. But also it's those characters very believably, they are completely, completely under 
Shyamalan and believe everything with it. And we see some scenes where even when they're given some evidence to the contrary, they won't even listen. And so it is believable that those characters would do that, still a little bit frustrating. And that's one of the things that's hard. The, the hard rule that fate is set made the time travel a lot easier to work around, made the visions of the future a lot easier to work around. But there were some of those moments where like, just this. And, and so that I think was unavoidable. But overall, really, like I said, this book comes together really well, and it is a very satisfying ending, though there are a couple of problems I had with certain pieces. And there were kind of three big issues I had uh, throughout the book. Two of them, it sounded like novellas were going to be set up, essentially, and at the very end, the author did leave a note specifically saying that one of those big questions would be answered in a standalone novel. So there is that, but the other two were not addressed at all. One of them's more of just a big question. The other one, to me, seems to be a pretty big plot hole. Um, and so those I'm going to discuss, as well as the portion of the big reveal at the end that I figured out early. Didn't get it all, but I, I was about 50, 60 pages from the end, and I all of a sudden it hit me, something that Eilington was going to do, and I'm like, Holy crap, well, I have to hurry up and get to the ending and confirm. But I'm going to talk about all those things. And I just want to reiterate one more time, these are huge spoilers. So even if you're a person that doesn't mind spoilers, I really recommend you skip this part if you've not read the book because this was a really great trilogy and some of this will kind of ruin things for you. With that, you can check the description and I will post in there exactly where you can skip to to get past the spoilers. But from there, I am going to jump in and talk about those things. So I'm going to try and kind of go in order with some of these things with what I thought and then talk about whether they were addressed or why I think it might be an issue, kind of so on and so forth. So right off the bat, pretty early, we see Wurr and he has a letter from Desia. She's apparently been gone for the entire year. We jump forward and we don't really know what's going on with her and her brother Aylbrick. And that kind of, to me, I, I didn't really care for the way that that was handled because it really seemed to be making excuse like we didn't really know what to do with these characters so we're just going to ignore them and you're not going to find them. Most of the book was like that and then they show up with an army from Nesk and just very pointedly say like oh it's a long story we don't have time to explain anything so I figured that had to be something that was going to be set up to be its own story. Uh, the author at the end did confirm there is going to be a standalone because there was just way too much. It sounds like actually not even a novella, a pretty decent sized novel following their story. So I understand that. And it sounds like that's going to be coming a bit later. I'm, I'm definitely interested to read that. But for me, it did take something away from the story because we see these characters, they're just gone, and then they kind of show up and save the day when Wurr was in that last stand mode. And I figured they weren't going to kill Wurr. I talked about in book two. It's just they really has to kill main characters. Uh, I figured he was going to be fine, and he ended up being. But in Orkney Almost More is only him and Terrace, I think, are the only two out of everyone who actually survive. And that's just like, come on. Literally, everybody else dies, but the two <laughs> characters we know and care about, really... Uh, and there were some actual deaths, of course, in The Light of All That Falls, but it seemed to be like you had to be just enough of a main character and you were fine. So that takes me out a little bit of it. Um, I thought that that whole last stand to stop the Ilshar from moving down was really nice. Side note, one of the things I loved about the Balazan series is Steven Erickson did not write that last stand that works out type narrative. Uh, he did things very differently. But... It's kind of, it was expected, so that will be addressed later, so I'm not going to dwell on it a lot. Like I said, it, it took something away from me. It felt like it was kind of that lazy, oh, it worked out because stuff that you don't know about happened. But, you know, neither here nor there. So one other big question that, at least from what I recall, was not answered was the identity of the person that Davian was fighting in the arena. We have that moment where the other fighter seems to recognize Davian, and sacrifices himself so that Davian will not have to fight him. And then there's this whole tense scene where Davian's trying to get his helmet off and see who he is and doesn't actually know. So that wasn't really addressed. Now, my theory 
is that that was some descendant of Raylith, uh, who it was either, I was thinking, going to be either Raylith or Neha, a descendant of theirs who somehow knew about it and was pulled. Uh, I, instantly, I thought that that person was the missing auger. We knew we were missing an auger, but then they like died and we found that they weren't the missing auger. Then with the other pots, I'm like, maybe it's like a descendant of Raylith or Neha. That obviously from the ending, which I will get to in a little bit here, not the case, at least with Neha. But that whole kind of thing never really was answered, and so I'm still really curious about that in general. Um, so that was a big one. And then something I do actually want to bring up here that I'm, I'm still a little bit confused on was I mentioned uh, in a past video the whole story Davian reads about Alaris and how he starts following Shamaloth. But we see 100% that Alaris believes he is following L. So that story still kind of confuses me. I thought that was intended to be more relevant than it was. And it just kind of was never brought up again. And apparently someone wrote a story about Shamaloth actually being who they were following. And I just don't see that, I guess. And we know Raylith wrote some sort of treatise. That definitely could not have been it. Like, that wasn't a, a treatise against the venerate. That was just a story. And so that still confuses me, and I feel like that wasn't really brought up um, that much. I did really want to know what happened with Raylith and Niha, and we kind of get a little bit there um, as well with the ending, but still kind of we don't really know what happened to Raylith, but there were the more important plot points. Before I get into the very end, though, I do want to talk about, for me, the big plot hole, because... We were told that Lycanius is a special weapon and it is designed to kill permanently the Venera, very specifically. We know from seeing it in action, it drains someone's source completely, but the big thing, it's supposed to sever their tie with the Forge. The Forge being how they're reborn every time that they die, but also their connection to Khan. Now, and no point that I recall, and I could be wrong here, I didn't do uh, a bunch of research on this or look into it, because I like to just make my videos right after reading with my reactions, and I'll probably dig into some of these things a little bit later um, and check around online. But at no point that I recall are we told that Lycanius actually allows you to channel Khan if you already can't. I don't think any random person could pick it up and then suddenly they can use Khan. But we see Caden who is stabbed with it, and they keep him alive. He's he's dead like Davian now and doesn't have a source. They keep him alive, but why can he still use Khan? And at first, he was like had the sword and everything, and I'm like, maybe it's just he's hanging on to it because he still wants to be the one to kill the venerate. And I'm thinking, I'm like, granted, I know he can use essence, but I feel like he would lose. But no, it's kind of just brushed over, and he can still use Khan. He comments on how it's a lot easier with having like Hanius, but... Once again, I don't feel like he should have been able to use Khan. Now, granted, that would have made it things really complicated uh, later on. But I feel like the thing is, we know at the end, he's going to have to be killed by Lycanius. And that whole bit where he was stabbed and technically dead, that's, it kind of occurred there. I mean, there were definitely some other hints along the way. But that's when it occurred to me, like, he's dead now. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, wait a minute, Davian's dead. And we were told many times that somebody has to be dead if you to shape shift into them. And the one part that was still confusing me is like, well, you have to actually have killed that person. And we did have the little bits and pieces where we weren't really sure who the people were that necessarily killed Davian in the story as we knew it uh, when he was a young boy. But that was the piece. But I'm like, somehow I figured he's going to shape shift into Davian and it's actually going to be him and Davian's going to survive. So I had figured that out, but definitely not the extent of it. Um, and still, I feel like, obviously, he had to be able to use Khan for that and use Khan without Lycanius uh, as well. But it just, like, that's that's the big plot. Like I said, I don't know if this has been explained somewhere else, but for me, that was the one thing that really took me out of an otherwise fantastic ending because it didn't make a lot of sense. Now, I want to get into the actual ending before I go on way, way too long, but I, I do feel like they, they did, you know, the kind of the happy ending, and I had figured that out, that that's definitely how it's going to end, but the ending with Caden slash Talcomar was just fantastic. 
And it was kind of that happy yet bittersweet ending. And for me, it was just such a perfect ending for that character. He's just decided that, you know, he doesn't care about fate. He's not going to let Davian, who's been his closest friend since he lost his memories and came back, and who he's met multiple times throughout the time stream, spent a lot of time with. He's just, he's not willing to let him die in his place. He feels like he's the one who deserves to die. Davian's still so young. He's got so much of life. So he says, screw it. He uses the only sever left to cut Davian off from Khan so that he doesn't have to die. He uses the vessel that we've been introduced earlier to help make sure that Davian can stay alive. And he decides he's going to go back in time. But he doesn't go back in time straight to Dylanus like you might think. And we get the first of the scene with Neha where we find out, which I was really wondering why they just glossed over him aborting the baby that she was very obviously pregnant with. It was a very subtle scene with Raylith and Neha, but it was really evident that that's what he did. He killed the baby so she could shapeshift into a dark Athen, and then we never talked about it again. But that's when we find out that he, specifically, he killed the baby, but because the baby was an auger, and we find out Davian, that he was able to pull in essence and still survive. And that was a huge reveal. I was not expecting it. Like I said, with the whole baby thing, I'm thinking maybe somehow the baby's going to survive and that's who Davian faces. And that's why they sacrificed themselves because they've been told about him. But that was crazy. And especially with Davian always wanting to know his parents. And still at the end of the story, he will never find out who his parents were at all. But the fact that he actually spent so much time with them and learned so much from them and was so close, it's kind of that crazy moment where he, even though he's never going to know, he did meet them. And it, that story was was really well done, I thought. It kind of explained what happened to him. And I figured there was going to be something there because we did have Terrace kind of not so subtly bring up like, well, did you, you brought me Davian when he was a baby, right? That was you. And I'm like, no, I didn't do that. I have no idea what happened. So you knew something was going to happen, but that was very satisfying. His whole getting to see his wife one last time, Eliaba. I, I know I pronounced that wrong, but there's too many, too many vowels. Uh, <laughs> but he gets to kind of see her one last time. We even had that discussion where he asks what she'd do if he died and says, you know, I'd hope that I would still somehow see you again in a world and kind of that he actually gets to see her again, talk to her one more time, actually say goodbye this time, even though he can't save her. And he kind of understands and he accepts that. And then him going back and having his just pure emotions as he's, even though his past self doesn't realize it's him talking to him, just explains you like, you have to be better. This is your fault. You have to take responsibility and become the man that you need to be. And it was just great. I, I, I loved that the whole the epilogue was just him going back through time for these different scenes. And it was just fantastic. And it was a perfect end for the character and really, really nice way to tie off the series. Now, I know this is starting to get on the long side. The uh, last thing I do want to talk about before kind of completely uh, ending this video and I'm going to be making another video that'll probably be out the Wednesday following this one kind of talking about it but I still did have one of my bigger issues with this book is the characters aren't written that well and it is something that was a problem and it's it, the characters aren't bad and the story is good enough that it makes up for a lot of it but you don't get a lot of depth of character. You're kind of just told these people have these this relationship. These people are doing this because that's the way they are. But it's usually that. You're more told than you actually see. So that was, I think, the, the weakest part of this book. Enough that I'm going to make my actual one negative video about this series uh, so far. Just going a little bit more in depth, my issues with characters. But overall, I do think this was a really fantastic series. It started, like I said, with a lot of inspiration from Wheel of Time, went a completely different direction and stayed there. And it was such a complete trilogy. There was so much action throughout. It was very fast paced, a lot going on. This definitely felt like it could have been longer, but I think keeping it in a trilogy kept it from really dragging and having 
passages that didn't matter. Usually if you're seeing something that was important, there was so many subtle clues and hints and foreshadowing. Some of them I picked up along the way, and some of them were still huge reveals uh, that I, I didn't pick up on, but so much going on here, and I really do think this is a great series. Uh, this is definitely, I would say, a lighter on you know the action. There is some you know death and battles, but things are kept pretty tame here. So I think this is something that is even acceptable for younger audiences as well as older audiences. This is uh, about as far from grimdark as you can be, and kind of more so the old style you know wheel of time with we have these things happening, but we're going to kind of gloss over some of it. Uh, and not really get into the details because that's not what it's about. And I don't have any problem with that. I, I've i read Grimdark that I've liked and I've read lots of stuff that's not Grimdark that I've liked. But I do want to bring that up. This does kind of go that lighter route. But honestly, if you like epic fantasy and you like these complex different pieces, uh, it does read a lot like inspiration things from the Wheel of Time, but a lot more like Brandon Sanderson's writing with the different complex rules and pieces that go along with the magic of the world. Uh, really, really good series. Definitely highly recommend this. I think anybody can enjoy it. It was uh, a blast to get through. And while it's not perfect, like I said, it is a fantastic series. So that is my review of the final Lycanius trilogy book. Do look forward to when the standalone novel comes out uh, at some point. I don't think that was really specified, so it sounds like it'll be a bit, but definitely looking forward to that. And uh, if you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. If you want to see more content like this and or the next video I'll be doing on Lycanius, definitely feel free to subscribe as well.